Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, Meet Dr. Luke, Dr. McLuhan introduces the man who authored more of the New Testament than anyone else. Dr. Luke writes precisely what Jesus said and did. Previously, in Exploring the Gospels, we met Matthew and Mark. And today, we meet the man who contributed more to the New Testament than any other of the authors. In all, Luke wrote 52 chapters of the New Testament, and when we combine the Gospel of Luke with the book of Acts, we discover that Luke wrote 28% of the Greek New Testament. His historical record spans over 60 years from the birth of Jesus and the John the Baptist to just before Paul was martyred in Rome. And by this time, Christianity had spread to most of the Roman world. We learn from Paul that Luke was a doctor because in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul identifies Luke as his beloved physician. Imagine having a personal physician to travel with you around the world. Luke and Paul developed a close, lifelong relationship first known contact that Paul had with Dr. Luke was in Troas. This is the first of three we sections in the book of Acts where Dr. Luke wrote himself into his own account. We read in Acts chapter 16, setting sail from Troas, notice the we, we made a voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we remained there some days, Acts chapter 16, verse 11 and 12. So you get this feeling of Luke uh, now being an actual eyewitness to all of the events that are going to take place. And this happens three times in the book of Acts. When Luke wrote we, uh, he is referring to Paul, Silas, Timothy, and himself. Now, we don't know where Luke was born, but what we do know is that not far from Troas was a famous medical school where Dr. Luke may have studied and even practiced medicine. As a physician, Dr. Luke received a classical education. His Greek is some of the best in the New Testament. He uses special vocabulary, particularly medical terms and some political terms not found in any other book in the Bible. In Philippi, Dr. Luke witnessed the power of God flowing through the hands of Paul, setting a young lady free from demons. I assure you, he didn't have a class on that in his school, and nothing ever happened like that in his practice. That was a mind-blowing experience for Dr. Luke. <clears throat> it appears that Dr. Luke remained in Philippi when Timothy Silas and Paul journeyed on across Greece. And the next we section in the book of Acts occurs some chapters later when Paul is returning to Philippi on his way back to Jerusalem. It must have been thrilling for Dr. Luke to listen to the stories and all the things that happened along the way in the cities of Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. The stories that, that the team had to share of what God had done. And Dr. Luke decided to join Paul on his journey back to Jerusalem. It would be his first opportunity, no doubt, to visit Judea. But along the way, Dr. Luke was about to be an eyewitness to some even more incredible miracles. Join me in Acts chapter 20, where we read, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days we came to Troas, and there we stayed for seven days, Acts chapter 20 and verse 6. Now, while Paul was preaching late into the night, a young man by the name of Eutychus fell asleep sitting by a window on the third floor of a building where this meeting was being held. And uh, people rushed down uh, to, to, the, to, to the street where Eutychus had fallen down, and he succumbed to his injuries and had died. And then we read that Paul went down, bent over him, 
And taking him up in the arms, he said, do not be alarmed. His life is in him. Acts chapter 20, verse 10. Aren't you glad a, a doctor was an eyewitness to that? I assure you, they hadn't had a class on that at Dr. Luke's school. And nothing like that had ever happened at the hospitals where he had worked. And it's an important part of the integrity of the New Testament that Dr. Luke was an eyewitness to this boy coming back to life. <clears throat> when I pray for people, I, I try to always remember to say, what has a doctor said about your condition? I want to know what doctors tell this person believes that they have. And when people are healed, I always like to ask them, go ask your doctor to see if you are healed. We never unprescribe people from medicine, but go talk to your doctor and let him declare that you have been healed. I, I've heard of some miraculous stories where people have been healed and called their doctor, and he said, if you're healed, I'll become a follower of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. We want the testimony to be so dramatic that there's no question that people have been healed. So when Dr. Luke arrived in Judea and began to interview people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it was not a problem for him to believe the reports that he was hearing because of the miracles that he had already seen. Uh, Luke was with Paul when he went up to Jerusalem to report to James and to the elders all that the Lord had done through their hands. Acts chapter 21, on the following day, Paul went with us uh, up to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that the Gentiles of the Lord had done amongst the Gentiles, and when they heard it, they glorified God. Acts chapter 21, verse 18 and 20. Now, while the elders rejoiced in this report, the Jewish leaders did not. And eventually, a riot broke out against Paul, resulted in him being taken as a prisoner to Caesarea. And Paul was there for two years. And while Paul was there, he had the opportunity to share the message of Jesus with many high officials, unusual opportunity. It must have been a trying time for Paul, but behind the scenes, God was giving Dr. Luke plenty of time to interview as many eyewitnesses as possible to the life and times of Jesus as he could. He took full advantage of that opportunity. And so listen now to how Dr. Luke introduces his gospel. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, we have delivered them to us, it seems good to me also, following all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Luke chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now Luke's introduction is filled with fascinating details, and we know exactly why and to whom both of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written. He states it clearly. He's written to a person. He wasn't thinking about you or me. He was thinking about one person when he wrote. And what a tremendous commitment he had made to share the message with Jesus, with this friend of his. <clears throat> uh, Luke wrote to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he called him Most Excellent Theophilus. Just draw your attention to that phrase for a moment. This is the same title that Paul used when he addressed uh, Felix and uh, and uh, Festus, they were the governors uh, in uh, Caesarea who, before whom he stood trial. It was a title that was used for court officials and for lawyers. Uh, so there was a tremendous uh, significance to that title. And so we posed the question, could it be that Theo Theophilus was a judge before whom Paul appeared or a lawyer who may be defending Paul's case in one of the many arrests that he had. Now, this view makes sense because of 
the way Luke writes. He gives the details of the birth and the life of Jesus, things a lawyer would want to know. And he wrote about how and why Christianity spread so rapidly. He points out that no less than three judges found Jesus innocent of any crime. And Luke also points out that at least five judges acquitted charges that were brought against the Apostle Paul. So could it be that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke when Paul was in prison in Caesarea and in Acts while Paul was in prison in Rome? Uh, his description of people in places and events is vivid and compelling. People reading the accounts for the first time find that they want to keep reading to the end to see what happens. Luke has introduced in a way that he didn't intend to, millions of people to the life of Jesus and the growth of the church. People from other religions, when they read the Bible for the first time, they find the writings of Luke refreshing, intriguing, readable. I've read a lot of religious books that just hardly made any sense. They just seemed all jumbled up. So he gave the most information about the births of John the Baptist and about Jesus. As a doctor, Luke had no problem believing that Jesus was born of a virgin. He understood why Jesus needed to be fully human and fully divine to fulfill the mission that God gave him to do. So between the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, Luke refers to the Holy Spirit 54 times. If you want to flow in the Holy Spirit, just flow in Luke's writing and ask God to give you understanding. He drew attention to medical details. He focused on Jesus' ministry to individuals, especially to how Jesus touched people. Luke uses the word touch more than any other writer in his gospel. He emphasized the place of prayer in our lives. And he elevated the role of women. This is one of the great contributions of Dr. Luke, is the elevation of women, not in his society or in the Jewish society, but in the church of Jesus Christ. The elevated role that women have is a beautiful thing. Luke's introduction to Acts, uh, the book of Acts, is as interesting as his introduction to the Gospels. Listen to how Dr. Luke begins the book of Acts. In the first book, referring to Luke, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. It seemed good to me also, following all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most Theophilus, that you can be, have certainty about the things you have been taught. He goes on to say Jesus presented himself after his sufferings by many proofs over a period of 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, some translations say convincing proofs. And Dr. Luke uses the root word, this proofs. It's a technical or it's a scientific term that Luke was fully convinced that the things that he had seen were scientifically verifiable. We can rest assured that Luke believed every word that he wrote. Now in the final we section of the book of Acts, we find Luke accompanying Paul on the journey to Rome to appear before Caesar. In this case, the Caesar was Nero. <clears throat> Along the way, their ship ran into a storm from which everyone miraculously survived. Now Luke's detailed account of this event is the most vivid description of the dangers that fa sailors faced in the first century. And when all hope was abandoned, Jesus appeared before Paul <clears throat> and said, you must stand before Caesar. And that goes all the way back more than 20 years when Jesus first appeared to him and said to him, you'll stand before kings and he said, you're not going to be cheated out of that great assignment because of this storm. You will make it. And in our lowest moments of doubt, whatever things will come through for us, I believe God with me. 
that there is hope at the other side. Your mission will be completed. The things that we must do is a theme in the writing of Luke, both the gospel and in Acts. Luke begins the letter to Theophilus by saying that he recorded what Jesus taught and did. <clears throat> and so there's saying and doing always go together in the kingdom of God. Now, this theme is clearly demonstrated in the account of the shipwreck at Malta. Many of you know I've been to Malta many times and enjoyed looking over that bay where there's no doubt Paul and all of these things happened. And while helping the survivors swim uh, and warm themselves around the fire that he built on the beach along with the locals, he was bitten by a poisonous snake. I don't know if you've ever felt like God is just too much, but that was a moment for Paul to have doubts about it all. But he did the best thing you can do when you have doubts, throw the snake back in the fire. <laughs> That's what he did. And he suffered no harm. And when he learns that the governor's father was ill, he prayed for him, and he was healed. After that, all the sick people on the island were brought to Paul, and he healed them all. What a remarkable story. Sometimes I hear pastors say the longer Paul went along, the less miracles took place. It's just not true at all. Dr. Luke must have been thrilled to witness this mass healing of people. Eventually, Paul and Luke arrived in Rome, where they were warmly greeted by local believers. And Paul was placed under house arrest, but free to receive visitors. Paul writes, Paul lived there for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, Acts chapter 28 verse 30 and 31. What a powerful history Luke has written. The message of Jesus' arrival from a humble manger to boldly announcing the message of Jesus from the capital of the Roman Empire. Sixty years, the first century world was transformed. Luke was in Rome when Paul was martyred for his faith. Luke continued for many years sharing his faith with others, talking with people about what he had seen and what he had heard and all the eyewitness accounts that he had had. He lived out the words that he recorded from Jesus. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and verse 24. Tradition tells us that at age 84, Luke was martyred for his faith in a small town just north of Athens in the country of Greece. Now, many times Dr. Luke had heard Paul preach this sermon, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. And Dr. Luke was not ashamed to die for Jesus. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in glory, the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Dr. Luke eagerly anticipated being united his dear friend Paul in heaven, but more importantly, Jesus was going to be there, and Luke was going to meet Jesus, his Lord and Savior, for the first time. Today, an invitation is being extended to you to accept what Jesus came to earth to do for you. Luke wrote, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus came to help us find purpose and meaning in life. I believe the Lord is drawing people to him today, but especially doctors and medical professionals, just like Luke, to follow him. Like Dr. Luke, you're successful, but you're looking for more in life than medicine and the rewards of being in the medical field. 
Jesus came to make it possible for us to have a close relationship with God. Ask Jesus to lift the uncertainty of where you will spend eternity from your back. Ask him to fill you with the presence of his Holy Spirit. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me on the cross to pay for my sin. And then I invite you, inviting me to live in a close relationship with you. You just prayed with me to accept Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message. Write to me and we'll share more information with you about what it means to follow Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for working miracles and giving your life to bring us back to God. May we be active participants and faithful witnesses to all the good things you are still doing in the world today. We give you all thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.